Hi folks, welcome to a January 2022 shop update video. Take a look at Johnny Five. It is absolutely awesome to see the head and the neck start to come together. The eyelids will mount right here. Apparently the eyelashes, I guess what you call it, the fact that they could kind of move is really what made people be able to relate to Johnny Five as a robot. And for me as a kid, so impactful, more so than I realized at the time. But if you go back and watch, short circuit in the very beginning uh, intro credits you will see an old school cnc machine and a turning center uh, i think there's even a cycle start button like super cool but seeing him like this is just absolutely awesome so i want to talk about some new stuff in the shop air compressor jib crane machines a little bit uh, as well as what's to come in 2022 and wrap up with some really awesome quality of life improvements that i think will be helpful for any manufacturing company um, so we needed a second air compressor so we picked up this FIAC uh, 7.5 horsepower rotary screw. Uh, it's quite similar to the Atlas Kafka that we already had. And one of the things that we've learned about running a rotary screw compressor is having the second one, it gives us a little bit of additional capacity. Uh, we run it in a lead lag. So the new one is the primary compressor. It's set to turn on, I think at 105 PSI, and then turn off at 140. The Atlas Kafka will only turn on at 95, so it really only is used if the shop happens to use so much air that the FIAC can't keep the PSI from dropping 295. Uh, and we can switch those over time so that the Kafka also gets ran. But the point is that this isn't doubling our capacity, it's mostly redundant. And what's great is that means when we wanna take a look at something in the compressor or do maintenance, et cetera, we can do it during normal shop hours by just shutting the ball valve off to it or shutting the air off or power off to it and doing work on it. Super nice. Um, and if one were to go down, we should be okay. There are times where if all the machines are running or we use an air tool or something where we will run out of air and having the two compressors is great for that. But basically uh, it's a lot more about redundancy. The other thing that we changed was I got tired of not being certain whether our drains were working and blowing stuff into these tanks that would cause stuff to blow up out of it. Just didn't like going into the bucket. And so we found these cheap uh, Walmart water jugs we put in a couple of quick disconnect uh, couplers here. One of them is the tank drain, the other is the uh, refrigerated dryer drain, and that way we can now see and monitor the level, make sure that they're working. Um, this is just an air vent so that when they do turn on and blow, uh, the stuff it minimizes what blows out. We could probably do some improvements on that. Uh, and then when you want to empty it, you can either use the spigot or you can disconnect both these lines, open this up and pour it out as needed. While we're over in this area though, the jib crane has been a huge help. This one was uh, somewhere between one and $2,000, um, but it was a, was a fair amount of money and more than that to have the foundation prep for it. So we'd have a contractor come and dig out, I think that's like a 40 or 50 square inch, 36 inch deep hole. Uh, it was about two cubic yards of concrete and they was worth bringing a little truck in rather than doing a bunch of ready mix bags. Uh, and then the rebar and so forth, but I wanted it done correctly and it's incredible to have it works pretty well in conjunction with these crates that we had built to store fixture plates and raw material. The idea is we can wheel them over, use the crane to lift stuff up as needed, and then lower it down, say, like onto a pallet and so forth. Um, where we're not quite there yet is the, continuing the overhaul of this whole space. I really want to flow. So as plates come off the machines, they need to go into QC and then anything else that needs done to them or paired up with the rest of their parts, their order, then flow this way where they can be either put into inventory or straight onto a pallet and then literally sent out the door. You know, we're still storing pallets over here. Um, some of this is orders, some of this is inventory. Um, we're just still working through some growing pains on that, but we've definitely made some progress. Next steps would be to figure out how to get rid of these tables. Um, we already kind of cut up our QC uh, area. We're actually working with uh, Kaiser foam. Uh, we've printed some samples, but some kind of custom jigs to help streamline the QC tools that we use. So we're coming along. I just wanted to talk about shipping. I think it's worth doing a whole video just on everything that we've learned and the mistakes that we've made on shipping a product. Just a basic soup to nuts on uh, everything from the e-commerce settings and the websites that we use and the vendors that we use to stuff like this. Uh, we bought a Fletcher. We found one used, so it is great. If you have a piece of cardboard uh, and you need to trim it down, set it in here. You can use the built-in ruler, lock it down. And like so, you have a straight, 
clean cut. It's a lot safer to use. It's a bit faster and it's been really nice. Don't get me wrong. I do not like making custom boxes and we'll talk a lot about that in the shipping video on the boxes that we bought. But inevitably, sometimes we need to do something to modify a box or build a custom box and having this and frankly the laser uh, has been really helpful for that. It's been absolutely awesome to have a much better list of plates and products that we keep in stock and in inventory. Simply put for our e-commerce sales or PO type of orders, when customers know that something is in stock and can ship the same day or the next day, uh, it's absolutely great. On the flip side, um, it's really expensive to store finished material. And what I mean is uh, not only does it cost money, like the products that can sit there, but it takes time and place to store it and organize it and sort it and potentially move it around. Um, and it's one of the things I've read before and I've heard before, but when you really live and breathe it, um, it's a big deal. Similarly, it's been a super weird year with COVID. Um, as I think many folks have probably heard, some materials and supplies have just become very difficult to get or prices have gone all over the place. And so for me, it was more important to make sure we had raw material than to necessarily worry about the last penny I could save or where the prices were moving because we're, we're, we're out of business if we can't buy the material to make the products that we need. So uh, we made sure we had enough material on hand, but I wasn't doing that with data. I was doing that with just my gut, to be honest with you. So one of our goals for this year is to take advantage of Lex, the, the ERP system that we built and the reporting metrics that we have to do a better job at um, we can have more on hand, we can have a surplus, I should say, but I don't want to have too much. I don't have a surplus of a surplus. And um, it's easy to, to feel a way, but I want to use data to actually show, hey, we have 90 days worth of product online or material online, and we know we can get this much extra, and here's the lead time. Like that to me uh, is how what I hear from companies and entrepreneurs that I look up to, a really strong grasp of that. We're getting there, we will get there, uh, but we're not there quite yet. A bit off topic, but not really. Uh, we realize everyone here really enjoys good coffee, and so we picked up a Jura. It makes a really good cup of coffee, and, and Grant was saying that we've had this thing for, I don't know, a month, and it's made like, I don't know, 250 cups. So I do not regret buying that. Kind of reminded me of the Area 419 uh, tour where they didn't cut corners on things that you know help with quality of life. On that note, though, I wanted to wrap up with three things that we've done that I think will be really helpful for anyone who's running CNC machines or a manufacturing company. But first, I gotta say, the Akuma has been absolutely awesome. It deserves its own video. We're working on it, we'll have that out. But the first thing that we did was we printed off of Thingiverse these little buttons. Uh, they, we leave them on the power off button throughout the day. It's just a good place to store them. Um, but where they're really helpful is if you want to pause the machine, uh, we do that with option stop. That means that when the machine hits an M1 or a tool chain, it won't proceed any further in the code. Sometimes you can forget why you did that or you just out of habit, go up and hit cycle start again. These are great. You know, they cost 20 cents to print and you just slide that right over the cycle start and it's just a great physical interference reminder of like, oh, don't hit this, I wanted it to do something. But to follow up on that, we printed a bunch of these little magnets. Um, I accidentally printed them out of TPU or rather that's just what I had in the machine. And I kind of like uh, that they're squishy, although PLA would work fine as well. Um, so we have one that says run option stop. And then we have run, reload code and run, setup in progress, chip bin has been removed, coolant valve is off, and then oh, speeds and feeds override. And they're great because now we don't have to worry about forgetting something ourselves or communicating to somebody else um, who may hop in and run the machine or check on something. Um, again, super inexpensive, super easy to make. Uh, and I'll tell you, we've done a lot of lean things over the year to try to help uh, make the shot better and so forth. And some of those things just don't stick. These these have worked really well. We've printed out a set for each one of the uh, machines and they all kind of live in the same spot. And when you need to put one on, again, whether to remind yourself or somebody else, super easy. The last thing that we did is we printed out machine spec sheets. Uh, we laminate them. They don't have to be laminated, but we put them on each one of the machines. And it has all the information that you know you want to have, uh, the serial number, the, the year, the model, the travel limit, the max feed rate, so that we don't accidentally post a cam error where we have a, a G0 or G1 move that's too fast. We put the coolant in there. We put in service notes, like if there's anything quirky about these machines that we need to think of a reminder, or what's the grease reorder part number in the pool stud. And then finally, who are the service contacts, the AE, the tech support, the sales guy, et cetera. Oh, we also put in the electric panel breaker number in the breaker panel because it's just so nice to have all that information in one spot. 
Uh, the master file is a Google Sheet that any of us have access to. So if we want to update something or add a note, easy to reprint it. Again, we can laminate it if you can. If not, no big deal. Uh, and really, it's been great. So I uh, wish that we had done that sooner because it's just one of those things where it's really nice to have that information handy. Otherwise, um, Vince has been crushing it on some new Tormach 8L recipes that have been up over on Proven Cut. Uh, we've got some video content coming out on that uh, as well. He's also been using the Shapeoko uh, HDM, which is really proving to be a pretty capable machine for the footprint. Otherwise, if you've been listening to the Business of Machining podcast, I've been chewing on a horizontal, debating between a 400 millimeter and a 500 millimeter, uh, but with a pallet pool, I think we're, we're at that point now. Just makes a ton of sense. Um, so continuing to kind of chew on that. Oh, and one last thing. I think we're gonna do a whole video on new 3D printed parts that we've made for the shop. But we realized, actually Garrett realized that when we are dumping our skimmer oil, a lot of the oil is actually coolant and that increases the volume of, of mix of oil and coolant. And so we printed these little baffle boxes and they, are, they have a separator baffle in it so that only oil comes out here and the coolant gets returned back to the tank. We'll do a whole video on that because we've got some other uh, 3D printed parts that are super useful, including some inserts on our Haas machines that have really helped minimize the amount of uh, washing down that we have to do. We've got one in the corner there. Ignore the uh, PEX tubing, that was a failed experiment. But they really help build up, avoid chips building up in the corners. And we've got bridges that go over the backside right there. So, as always folks, hope you learned something, hope you enjoyed, take care, see you soon.